everybody, and welcome to From the Mezzanine. I'm your host, Lindsay Stone. On From the Mezzanine, we talk about Broadway news, Broadway grosses, and let's be honest, just the tea and the gossip that goes on week to week in the Broadway stratosphere. How is everybody doing? I hope you had an amazing week. I hope you've seen Mean Girls, the movie musical like I have, and I'm sure you're being very inundated with all of the content on whatever your uh, social media platform of choice is, because I cannot scroll on TikTok more than two videos without people let's be honest, crapping on Mean Girls the Musical. But I don't want to start that off. I don't want to start off this week's episode on that sour note because I, for one, want to talk about the good things about Mean Girls the Musical because I don't think that it was all bad. But before we get to that, I saw Hell's Kitchen off-Broadway at Joe's Public Theater, and we need to talk about it. Let me just shut my computer so I can give Hell's Kitchen my undivided attention. Okay. My dear Broadway bestie brand shout out. Got these tickets. Student discount. I think they were $40 a piece. Literally pennies on the dime for this quality of a show. I didn't have any expectations going into it. I had heard hardly anything about it. I knew Alicia Keys uh, was behind it and producing it, and I knew that it was headed to Broadway, but I really hadn't heard much about Hell's Kitchen, and so I am here to promote the heck out of it because I adored it. So let's talk first about the things that I loved about it. The biggest thing for me was that I feel that so often Shows aim to achieve a cultural representation of a group of people, such as like in the Heights, that was representing the people of Washington Heights, such as West Side Story, um, all all kinds of things, all kinds of shows that are, you know, surrounded like Once on This Island, it's surrounded by the culture of these people in the show. And I feel like oftentimes in musical theater, it can really go wrong when they try to do that because it's insincere, whether it be the dialogue or the costumes or the type of choreography. And so something that recently happened that comes to my mind where this was done and not done well was New York, New York. They were like like the famous... Like I keep referring to this uh, quote from I think it was the New York Times article review of it is that they they took a snapshot of New York City and that's as much of the culture as they showed. It was vague. It wasn't deep. It wasn't it wasn't true to the different cultures that they were aiming to represent. It didn't achieve that at all. It was surface level. You didn't you didn't identify with those characters as somebody should have, and it, it was insincere altogether. And so that's an example of something that tried to embrace a culture of people and show that on a stage and failed. Another one that did really well would be, well, in my opinion, would be Paradise Square when they were representing um the Irish uh, people coming over to America and clashing with the people who lived in the Five Points. And so it was, that was a really great representation through like choreography mostly because that was a very choreography heavy show, um, but also through the accents and through everything. I just thought that it did a really sincere and honest depiction of those people who lived in New York City in those times. And along with that that stream of all of these shows that have represented a culture well, uh, Paradise Square, In the Heights, we have Hell's Kitchen. I feel, and I know, because Alicia Keys, I do not believe is going to put anything out that is any less than perfect in her eyes. I think that she's very artistic and she's very specific, I have to imagine. And I know that this achieved representing the people of Hell's Kitchen so incredibly. I felt like I was immersed in the culture of the people of Hell's Kitchen. So let's talk about like what kind of people are depicted in this show. It's representing artists. It's representing many different demographics. It's representing people from low income families. It's representing a lot of different people. This kind of like hodgepodge of all these different people from different walks of life that all meet in Hell's Kitchen and live there because it is, you know, midtown New York City. So it is a meshing of all the cultures. And that is what I think Hell's Kitchen achieved 
greater than anything else that it did in this show. And there were a lot of good points, but the best thing it achieved was really depicting the culture of Hell's Kitchen. And I thought that was astounding. They did it through their choreography. Holy cow. This is going to win the Tony for best choreography. I am speaking it into the ether right now because I do believe that it will win. The choreography is so incredible and it's nothing like I've ever seen. Nothing like I've ever seen on Broadway ever, ever, ever. And it was so good. And it was so representative of the characters in the show. And then the costumes. I loved, loved, loved the costumes. It was streetwear. It was, oh my God, I couldn't get away with wearing any of this because it was way too cool. It was amazing, amazing costumes. I love the main girl, Allie's costumes. She slayed the house down. She looked so good. But yes, every single aspect of this show, I felt like really depicted and held true to the message they were conveying and the people that they were representing of Hell's Kitchen. So let's talk story. The story for me is like the one part of the show that isn't very like convicting. So the story follows this young girl named Allie and she is somewhat autobiographical from Alicia Keys, but not entirely. I think they they are trying to make a point to say this isn't truly an autobiographical story of Alicia Keys, but it's a story that aligns similarly to her experience growing up in Hell's Kitchen. Um, so Allie is growing up. She's young. She's 17. She has a mother who is pretty strict on her, but at the end of the day, only wants what's best for her. And she is uh, getting mixed up with this guy who's an older guy who she really has fallen hard for. And and you get to see like their dynamic of her chasing this guy and, and what she has to do to try and uh, win his affection. And she's got these other two friends, too, that are really, really cute. And so they all live in this one building, this artist's building in Hell's Kitchen. And then slowly Allie realizes that she has like a deep affinity for playing the piano. And that's where she starts really finding herself and realizing that I don't need to chase this boy. Like I can, I can find happiness, you know, when I'm playing my piano and learning from my very wise piano teacher. And uh, she has an absent father that comes and goes from time to time through the show. But in the end, it's truly a story about her relationship to playing the piano and finding herself through that. And then it's really about the relationship between a mother and a daughter, which is just so sweet. And Shoshana Bean, can we take a moment to talk about Shoshana Bean? I've never seen her perform before. I've heard her sing at events and things, but I've never seen her act and perform. She slayed. I know I keep saying this, but she slayed the house down, guys. Shoshana is one of the best and most talented actresses that I've probably ever seen. And the way that she embodied her character as the mother, as Allie's mother, so well. This badass mom who is going to do whatever she can in her power. And maybe she does too much at some times, but she is going to mama bear and protect her child. And she sings some powerhouse songs that make you feel really lucky to be in that audience. So thank you, Shoshana, for providing us with that in Hell's Kitchen. That was just in and of itself. She was amazing. And I know a lot of the musical theater people like would worship the ground that Shoshana walks on. And now I finally can understand why. So the outstanders for me, man, this cast, everybody and I mean everybody, was freaking incredible. So Shoshana Bean obviously was amazing. Allie, which is played by uh, Malia Joy Moon, she was unreal. She could win Best Actress at the Tonys. Nuck, who is played by Chris Lee, he was stellar. I loved him. He really gave Nuck a lot of depth. Nuck is the character that Allie falls in love with. Um, Let's see. We did have a couple understudies. You would never know. Anyways, it was an electric audience to be in. A lot of the people I feel like who went and saw this show, they were just living for it. And the energy in an audience can definitely make or break a show. And when you know you're sitting in, in an audience where everybody is on the same page and they're all standing for what is going on on stage, you know you're in the right place and you know you're seeing an amazing show. So I cannot speak the praises enough about Hell's Kitchen. From the costumes to the choreography to the music, freaking incredible. And at the very end, kind of spoiler, but kind of not, at the very end, when they sing Empire State of Mind in New York, like, 
I like welled up with tears because that was just a full circle moment. It was incredible, incredible because I mean, it was just like you take a breath and you're like, oh, I'm so lucky to live here. Like this place is so amazing. And like seeing a show like Hell's Kitchen reminds you like that there's all different walks of life here and like there's so much culture and history in this city. And it really like was electric to finish it out with singing New York or Empire State of Mind. Like, come on. That's that's such a stellar song. Uh, but I do want to criticize some things. So let's let's criticize just a couple of things. Um, and this is honestly for people who have probably seen the show. They're going to understand this. I think if you haven't seen the show, you possibly wouldn't be able to relate to this. So it is an undisputed fact that uh, this girl is on fire is one of Alicia Keys's best songs. And so you would think for Alicia Keys' musical Hell's Kitchen that it would come in at a powerful moment when Allie is killing it and she's figuring out who she is and everything. No, it comes on at a very inopportune time in the show and it really, really, really takes you out of it. And it feels as though they finished writing the musical and they said, crap, we forgot to put a uh, girl on fire in the musical. We need to add it in somewhere. And it feels like they just like, or like did a with their eyes closed, like pin the tail on the donkey and just dropped it in at one random point because it really doesn't make sense. And it should be this powerful moment. And where they have it, it's like in the middle of act one, like it's not even like at the end of act one, which it should be because it's one of her biggest songs. When they're doing it, it's like at this moment in the show when Allie is starting to like be successful with pursuing her relationship with Nuck and then like one of her friends comes out mid while they're singing a uh, girl on fire and she's like are we really gonna say that she's this girl is on fire when she's just got a man like are we really gonna like give her a round of applause for just being cuffed like this doesn't make sense like are we really gonna applaud her for this you know and so it's it, and I agree with that. Like, are we really singing this song right now? Like, there's not really a reason that we're singing like, this girl is on fire. I don't know. They should start it with that song, I think, too. That could work really, really well. Just to kind of set the tone that Allie is meant for more. She's just a girl, but she's a flame. Like, I could see that being a really good start to the musical because it's like, she's just a girl, but she's a flame. Like, she's got to grow to be bigger as you watch the musical go along. Um, they just need to really change that song. It needs to come at a different point where it makes more sense. And when we're not, like, cutting in the middle of the song going, like, are we really singing this to her right now? Like, she's not deserving it. Like, that was just not right because it is Alicia Keys' one of Alicia Keys' biggest songs. Um, speaking about Alicia Keys' songs, I didn't know a lot of the songs in here. I think a lot of people are more well-versed in Alicia Keys' music than me. I know the ones that are on the radio and the big ones. Um, but I enjoyed the songs nonetheless. Like, um... It, it definitely felt like not your typical musical where they're singing about what they're doing because they kind of had to just like grab Alicia Keys song and put it into the musical. Um, and so it's kind of more like symbolic of the situation at hand, if that makes sense. Instead of more literal, like obviously in musicals, they're literally like singing about what they're doing right there because the music was written for that scene. And so whenever you're grabbing somebody's music and putting it into a musical, you can't be like, I'm singing it in the rain. I'm singing it in the rain. I hope that made an ounce of sense. Um, but I really liked the songs, even though I didn't know a lot of them, uh, to be honest. But that's really all that I have to criticize. They really need to change where Girl on Fire goes. And uh, I think it should go at the beginning of the musical because that would just get everybody into it. Because the beginning song was good, but it wasn't a song that I recognized. And I think if you started out with Girl on Fire, that would be really good. You start it with one of her biggest songs and you end it with one of her biggest songs with Empire State of Mind. But I cannot speak the praises of Hell's Kitchen enough. I freaking loved it. Without further ado, let's talk about Mean Girls the Movie Musical. Oh my gosh, guys. So Mean Girls the Movie Musical came out this week. Have you seen it? I hope that you have. I saw it on Wednesday, January 10th. So it was somewhat of an early screener. And I have to tell you all the craziest thing happened. So after work, me and my friend were meeting up to go and see it. And I had some time to kill after work and before the movie started. So I was like, eh, I'm just going to go walk over to Rockefeller and go and see if the Christmas tree is still lit up because I love the Rockefeller tree. And I walk over there and then what do I hear? 
This is modern feminism talking. I will run the world in shoes I cannot walk in. I was like, they're playing Mean Girls soundtrack. The unreleased Mean Girls soundtrack. Because it hadn't been released by that point. And I like was trying, like literally freaking out. I was wanting to cover up my ears because I was about to go and see it. And I had been avoiding all of the spoilers and avoiding all the songs. Like I hadn't listened to anything. Even though some things had been like leaked. I wasn't listening to anything. Um, and so I walk over to the ice skating ring. I'm like, is something going on? Like, are they here? And on the rink. It's lit up pink and they have this area to the side that has like a big poster about Mean Girls the movie. It looked like they were doing a premiere. And so I Googled, I was like, oh my gosh, Renee Rapp about to walk out. Like, I swear to God, if I am about to see Renee Rapp when I'm about to go see her in the movie, like, I'm not going to be okay. So I Googled it and it turns out maybe they were there. I'm not certain if they were there or if they were not. But it turns out that they were doing like some deal where if you like skated at that time, it was like Mean Girls Hour and you would get free tickets to the movie on the 12th. Obviously, that didn't benefit me at all because I was about to go and see it right then. Uh, But that was really surreal and kind of a crazy New York moment where it's like, You just happen upon these things. Like, I just happened to walk over to Rockefeller and I heard the unreleased soundtrack and could see that they were doing some sort of movie premiere down on the skating rink. Like, that was crazy. But let's talk about the movie itself. Okay, I want to start off with, I really enjoyed the Mean Girls movie. Really, really enjoyed. Renee Rapp, like, come on, come on. Like who on God's green earth is more talented than Renee Rapp? She can do everything. She is a triple threat. She is so freaking Regina George. And the way that she made that character so her own, like, come on. It was insane. Her voice was unbelievable. Her sex appeal as Regina was crazy. Like Renee Rapp, honey, you have us in a chokehold. And That was unbelievable casting. They couldn't have put anybody else in that role. It it was it was quite an experience and she couldn't have been better. Her I loved the somebody gets hurt part when they were at the party. And I loved how devious and evil she was. And I just loved the choreography in that scene and how it all got dark and everybody was frozen and they're like shaking like. I loved that scene. I thought visually it was so beautiful and so intense and so scary like. I never would have thought that they would have done that scene like that, but it was the way to go. There were some really high highs in this movie and then some really low lows. So on the other side, we have our two leads, which I would say are like Regina and Katie. And where Regina, Renee Rapp, was freaking on the moon with talent. I I hate to say, like literally I hate to say this, but Angry Rice, I gave her the benefit of the doubt. I was like, I don't know this girly. Um, I haven't seen her act in anything. I did find one YouTube video where she was singing. I thought, okay, she sounds all right. She sounds pretty good. But of course, like this is a musical. She's going to have to step it up. No, no, no. Angry Rice has a voice that was not, not my preference. I really don't want to be insulting because I, I have seen all of the billions of videos out there that are insulting her. And I don't want to do that because I thought her acting was really good. Let's talk about the good things, right? Okay. I thought her acting was really, really good. I thought she played Katie well. Um, Bryn, my friend I went and saw it with, made a really good point. She was like, Lindsay Lohan, whenever she was in Mean Girls as Katie, whenever she was supposed to be like the sheepish, nerdy, awkward, like uh, girl from Africa, it wasn't believable because it was Lindsay Lohan and she's stunning and she's a killer, you know? Like, but angry rice you could see her as that nerdy dorky mathlete girl and then when she like stepped it up and she was a plastic you like she looked hot too so it was easy to see her as both sides of the spectrum whereas like Lindsay lohan it wasn't as easy and so for that reason i think angry was good they did a good job of like you know giving her a character arc throughout the musical for sure so that's good that's a good thing character arc okay her acting was really really good um okay I I can't tell, though, if the issue with her singing was with the music that they gave her or it was truly with her vocals. Her vocals were flat. Not she didn't sound flat, but like not an ounce of vibrato in that voice, which I don't know how you can sing that those songs without adding like a hint of vibrato, especially if you've listened to the musical version. I don't know if you all have seen it, but like there's some like sound out there where they have like one line of like 
stupid with love I didn't get it. And then it cuts to the musical version. I didn't get it somehow. And it like just shows the difference between the movie version and the musical version. And they couldn't be more different. The musical version is spunky. It's pop. It's funky. It's giving you like all of the feelings. And then the movie version is just like flat. Stupid with love. I didn't get it. They couldn't be more different, and I don't know why they went in such a dry direction with Katie's songs. I think it did help her character arc, because once it gets to Revenge Party, she's got, like, a little more oomph in her voice. Not not nearly as much oomph as the musical version had, but that was a major issue for me. Like, Regina's songs were slaying the house down. They were scary. They were good. They were powerful. And then Katie's songs were sheepish and shy and flat. That was a major problem. Uh, I, I, I kind of can bop my head around to the movie version of Stupid with Love. Like, I can't lie. Like it sounds pretty good, but when you compare it to the musical, it's just like they don't compare. One is far better and more interesting than the other. Um, and so yeah, that was kind of a letdown. So that's probably all I want to say about Angry Rice because there's really nothing else to say. I think that they could have cast somebody a lot more interesting in the role, and I really think they should have considered Sabrina Carpenter for the role. She played Katie on Broadway for literally two shows right before COVID happened. She played Katie with Renee Rapp before uh, Mean Girls shut down for good. And I think Sabrina would have been much more interesting. She's such a pop icon right now. And I think that she probably would have done it since she's popping off right now. And since Renee Rapp was in it, too, I think that she would have considered it. Um, And she's an actor, you know, from the Disney Channel days. I think she would have been a really good Katie. But. Angry's character really brought it down. But another thing I want to talk about, well, before we move away from the characters, I do want to say I think Karen was stunning. She's the prettiest person I've probably ever seen, and she was so good. I thought she brought a lot to the role and played Karen very, very well. Um, Like, her sexy was very, very good. The song, sexy. Uh, I loved it. I loved, like, the dance break. Like, that's probably one of my favorite parts. Um, Now I want to criticize the movie itself because I do, where I did really, really enjoy it, I also really disliked their heavy relying on technology. Uh, TikTok was a very big part of this movie. And I think when you do a very modern story like this, if you rely too much on technology, it takes away a lot of the quality of the movie. I don't know if anybody else feels this way, but it's like we're on TikTok all the time. Like we're on our phones all the time. When I'm watching a movie, I don't want to see all these people be on their phones. And so it also just brings away like the movie magic of a lot of things. Like in the original Mean Girls, she's walking through the halls and she's throwing the papers everywhere and the halls are literally covered in a pool of the burn book papers. And it's epic and it's wild and you're like, holy cow, they must have spent 10 hours at the Kinko's printing all of these pages off, right? Whereas not really spoiler, but kind of spoiler, I guess. Whereas in Mean Girls, the movie musical, she just walks into school and drops the burn book, totally not epic at all. And then somebody picks it up when school starts, takes a picture, and then it all starts circulating, but all through like TikTok videos. And so it's just way less epic and crazy and wowing you, you know? And so that's something that I disliked about this movie. I think that they relied way too heavily on technology and TikTok and the modern age. And it just kind of felt like, why am I not watching this on Hulu? You know, like it was supposed to originally come out, I think on like Paramount Plus maybe actually. It's not giving quality whenever it's like phones everywhere. I don't know if that's just me, but I thought it it really pulled back from like the, the epicness and the magic that a movie can bring. I do want to give like an extreme major shout out because to me, the best characters were Janice and Damien. Ali Cravalho and Jaquil Spivey owned, literally owned this movie. They were the best parts. Their songs were always the best and their like duo, their chemistry was solid. They had such good chemistry as Janice and Damien. I was so impressed. I knew I didn't need to worry about Jaquil. Y'all know in the early days when they had first announced the characters, I was a little hesitant about Ali, but now that I've seen her as Janice, like, mm -mm, honey, she was Janice through and through, and so is Jaquil. They, they were perfect. They, to me, were probably, other than Renee, the best castings, the best castings of the entire thing. But if you haven't seen it, I don't want to give away anything too much, but I do want to say they did do a lot of like really fun callbacks from earlier Mean Girls and uh, some little Easter eggs in there for us like OG Mean Girls lovers. Uh, really, they really, I think they handled the material well. 
And uh, let's get into our Broadway grosses, and then we'll get into our first news story, which will circle back to Mean Girls. Okay, guys, so Broadway grosses for this week. This is the week ending on January 7th. So our top of the leaderboard is The Lion King, as always. Number two, we have Wicked. And three, we have Sweeney Todd, which means Hamilton is fourth. Holy cannoli, that's crazy. By the way, guys, it shows on the, the website I use is broadwayworld.com for the grosses. And it shows uh, like what they grossed the week before. And they literally like all had a decrease of like two million dollars because it's not uh january 1st it's not a holiday week anymore but that is crazy like sweeney todd was what weren't they like eighth last week and now they are third baby that's crazy it just goes to show how much a tourism week can do like they really hold so much power um but also a big part of this too is that josh groban and annalee ashford as of yesterday they left sweeney todd so this was nearly their last week so a lot of people are going to see it because they want to go and see them one last time I'm sure so Lion King Wicked Sweeney Hamilton and then at fifth we have Merrily We Roll Along sixth we have Harry Potter seventh we have Aladdin MJ is eight that's kind of surprising because MJ was so high last week Back to the Future is nine and Moulin Rouge the musical is ten Whew, okay now let's look at the bottom I'm so scared I'm so scared all right, How to Dance is at the bottom, and they've seen quite a decrease from the week prior. Um, this week, they had a 67% capacity, whereas the week prior, they had an 83% capacity due to all of the tourism. Harmony is just above them with 62% capacity, and then Kimberly is right above them at 89%, and then A Beautiful Noise is right above them, and A Beautiful Noise has 59% capacity. Oh my gosh. That is wild. And then Hades Town is above them. But they have 101% capacity, so slay Hades Town. That is our week in Broadway grosses, guys. Let's get into our first news story. Circling back whoop, to Mean Girls the Musical to talk about how they are bringing the house down at the box office. So, in their first weekend in theaters, Mean Girls grossed $28 million. This put them at first place in the box office. Granted, there's not like a ton of big blockbuster movies right now. Um, their big competition was The Beekeeper with Jason Statham, which I wasn't even aware was in the box office. I've never heard of that movie before. Sorry. Um, but that's their big competition and they beat them. So they're number one. So good. Good for them. I'm glad they're doing well. It is estimated that after the holiday weekend, after Monday and everything, that it will reach up to $32 million at the box office, which would be, I believe, a whopping hit for them. That's very exciting. They've said that all of their marketing, their many campaigns, I mean, I've seen them everywhere after all of that, that they have really seen the returns and that they're getting a lot of people in to go and see the movie. But when we talk about that, you know, what we haven't talked about yet is that a lot of people didn't know that this was going to be a musical. Therefore, people are stunned when the, it starts and they're breaking out into song every five minutes. And that really hurts me. That really hurts me from the inside because I don't want people to like be blindsided and figure out that something is a musical after they've already paid their money to go and see it and then like get pissed off that it's a musical because one, that makes like musicals look sneaky and like People can't trust any sort of thing that's going to come into the box office for fear of it being a musical. Plus, I think it just like does bad things for the musical brand because if like people who don't like musicals should not be going to see a musical because you're not going to enjoy it. It's literally you love it or you hate it. Obviously, if you're listening to this podcast, it's like you likely you fall on the other side of the spectrum where you literally love it and worship musicals. Um, however, there's a whole nother side out there that don't listen to this podcast, have never even heard of Wicked, and they don't want to go and see a musical, but they've heard of Mean Girls and they're going to go see the new Mean Girls. But once they get in there and find out it's a musical, they're going to be pretty pissed off. And so I just like for the brand, for us, like I don't like that. I don't like that at all. I've seen a video online where Katie like starts singing um, Stupid with Love and everybody in the audience is like, oh, oh go, ha, ha, ha. like, oh, this sucks. Like they're singing again. Like and I just hate that. I hate that. In my theater, everybody was like it was about to be um, world burn and I could tell like the energy was changing. Everybody was like, oh, my God, it's about to be world burn. Oh, my God, it's about to be crazy. And everybody was excited. But I don't think that that's going to be the general consensus when you're in like 
a regular theater that isn't an early preview, I think people are going to be upset when they find out that they're singing. And I thought it was going to be okay, but now that it's happening and we're in it, I don't like it. And I just feel like it wasn't a good move to not market it as a musical because you're going to get all of these people in and you've kind of bamboozled them and they're going to be more pissed off that they saw a musical and they're not going to enjoy it. So that kind of like makes me sad. Like I really hate that for the brand, but there's nothing I can do about it now. And maybe, maybe it'll work out the other way around and people will be like, oh, actually, like I kind of loved it. I know it was a musical and I always say I hate musicals. I know, I know, I know, but I kind of loved it. Like I hope that that's what happens, but I don't have enough faith in humanity and in the power of the musical to believe that that could happen. Okay, so let's talk new casting at Hades Town, guys. Hades Town is starting to, you know, give a little bit of Chicago, kind of a revolving door over there of all of these stars. And I think they might be doing something right with this next casting. Lola Tung, who you know from the summer I turned pretty, will be making her Broadway debut in Hades Town. Yay! Congratulations, Lola. That is so exciting. She said in a statement, quote, I saw Hades Town in February of 2020 and immediately fell in love with the show. She goes on to say, quote, I'd had dreams of being on Broadway since I performed in my middle school musicals. And after seeing Hades Town, I instantly added it to the little list of dream shows in my mind. Quote, very cute. We all have that list. I have to admit, I know a lot of people would probably love to play Eurydice. And I'm really, really happy that Lola is going to be able to do that. I have heard videos of her singing and she's stunning. She is very, very, very talented. She went to LaGuardia High School, I believe, and I think she studied at Carnegie Mellon. I saw something about that. So she is a very, very professionally trained vocalist. Well, maybe not like professionally, but she has experience. And I think this is a great casting. She is a big celebrity. A lot of people are going to come and see this show just to see her. And I think that they'll be very pleasantly surprised because she has the acting and the singing chops to fill this role of Eurydice. She'll obviously pl be playing opposite of uh, Jordan Fisher, which is really exciting too. But when I saw this news came out, I thought, oh my God, Celia Pfeiffer is already leaving. I feel like she just got in into that role. But sure enough, she is going to be departing from that role on February 4th. So if you want to go see Solia, which she is like so stunning, I would love to see her in this role. I like love her attitude. I think she's a really cool Broadway girly. But she will be leaving on February 4th and Lola Tung will be stepping into the role on February 9th. And it is only a limited engagement. So Lola will only be in the role until March 17th. So you have until February 9th up until March 17th to go and see her. So you literally only have two months to go and see her. That is so short, but very exciting and very very excited for Lola to be fulfilling this dream. Like, good for you, girlfriend. Good for you. And in the spirit of casting news, before I let y'all depart, we just have to talk about Derek Kleena returning to the Moulin Rouge as Christian. So you'll know how I feel about Derek. He's my least favorite Christian I've ever seen. I, I, I literally hate to say it, but like, maybe it was an off night. Like, I want to give him the benefit of the doubt, but it just was not, not it. I didn't feel the heart in his performance. It was not it for me. However, a lot of people love him. They really do. He's not my favorite by a long stretch, but, you know, John Cardoza's on the notebook, so I guess, you know, they had to compensate and bring Derek Kleena back. Derek Kleena will be returning to the Rouge uh, on February 6th after Casey Cott departs on February 4th. Now, Casey Cott is really committed to this role. He's been in this role for a really long time. I haven't seen him in it, which is crazy. I haven't seen him perform. I haven't seen him sing. I've gone to so many Broadway events and I've never, ever seen Casey Cott sing, which is crazy. But this is only in like two or three weeks, so I probably won't. I'm going to miss out on seeing Casey Cott perform. I have seen Casey Cott on the street, though. I walked past him and said, I want to come see you as Christian. And he was like, okay. Like, didn't even say anything. I don't think he just like kind of gave me like a, a little wave, which, you know, is warranted. But yes, indeed, Derek will be returning to the role. I think for the third time. This is his third time circling back to the role, which honestly, like, I love Moulin Rouge for this, that they will always bring somebody back. Like, Aaron has been back twice now. Well, technically three times since he did that one stand-in. I like that they always keep bringing people back, even if it's people that I don't necessarily love their performance. But I like that they, like, stay true. Like, oh, okay, your contract is up over there. Okay, come on back to the Rouge. Like, once you're a family of the Rouge, you're never, you know, 
turned away. Like I said, he will be returning to the Rouge on February 6th. Uh, if you don't know Derek Kleena, if this is your first time hearing his name, he was really, really good in Anastasia. Um, I love his songs in that. And he was also in The Jagged Little Pill, which is one of my Broadway favorites, one of my guilty pleasures. And just to give you all a little bit of an update. So by the time Derek Kleena rejoins the cast in early February, this will be the same day when Boy George is stepping into the role too. So we will have two new, new in air quotes because Derek's not technically new, but two new people joining the cast as of February 6th, which is very exciting for uh, Boy George. I'm really excited to see how they do at the Rouge. I think they'll be an excellent Harold Zidler. And uh, I'm wearing my Eric Anderson shirt today that I got from the Broadway flea market. It's Eric Anderson as Harold Zidler. I love this shirt. Now that Titus has departed, Eric Anderson is back at the Rouge, which is good to see too. See, they just kind of like be bringing people back left and right. Like, okay, we had our fun little stunt casting. Now it's time to bring back the OG Eric Anderson. Bring him in. I always say the OG, even though he's not the OG. I know, I know, Danny Bernstein. How long do y'all think Derek Clean is going to stay in the role? He's a busy guy. He's got kids. Like, he's not going to stay for forever. I don't want another stunt casting. I just want somebody better. I'm sorry. I just, I can't with Derek. He's not terrible. I think he has a pretty voice. It's just, Christian is supposed to be this artiste and this young, naive boy who has just come to Paris and he's and he's flying by the seat of his pants and and he falls in love with the beautiful sparkling diamond and he's so taken by her and oh my gosh like his emotions uh, he wears them on his chest and and he's supposed to be just this like this boyish perfect man who makes mistakes and is in love and Derek Kleena plays it too tight laced like he's got it too buttoned up and, and I'm like give me something give me some sense of naivety and boyhood and like like you are a singer songwriter like give me an ounce of it like give me something and he just is a prince like he just plays it like a prince like a prince charming and maybe that's because well no he wasn't a prince in Anastasia but he was practically a prince I don't know that's how I feel but it's okay there will be another casting there will and Moulin Rouge will live on because it's doing stellar in the grosses week to week. So I have nothing to fear. All right, guys, with that, thank you so much for listening to From the Mezzanine. You can find From the Mezzanine on YouTube now. We have a YouTube, guys. Please go subscribe. I think we're, I don't know. I don't want to throw a number out there, but we could really use some help over there. Um, if we get to 50 subscribers, by the end of January, this is crazy. This is a really, really crazy goal. What will I do? I will perform a musical song in front of the theater, either Hamilton or Moulin Rouge. If we hit 50 subscribers by the end of January and I will post it on YouTube. This sounds like I'm going to embarrass the crap out of myself, but like I got to get 50 subscribers. I need to do it somehow. So, so here's what I'm going to do. I will perform a Hamilton song in front of the Richard Rogers and post it on social media if we hit 50 subscribers on YouTube. So go and subscribe. Oh my God, this is, this is not my best judgment at all, but I will do it because I need to hit 50 subscribers on YouTube. So go subscribe on YouTube, guys. Watch the videos on there if you want to uh, see the podcast visually as well as audio. Um, and yeah, you can find us on Spotify, Apple, Amazon Music, all listening platforms. And you can also also go and find me on TikTok. I'm so much fun over there as well as on Instagram at from the mezzanine podcast. All of my social media links are in the show notes down below. And thank you guys so much for listening to this episode. I will see you next Tuesday. Bye.